Joining us on the line from Phoenix, Arizona, Rebecca Skloot, science journalist and the author of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Rebecca, it's good of you to join us on the line from uh, the western coast of the United States. And I've got to tell you, this is just a remarkable story. Uh, you've spent 10 years trying to tell it, so let's go through it if we can. Let's start out. Absolutely. Who was Henrietta Lacks? Henrietta Lacks, as you said, she was a poor African-American tobacco farmer from southern Virginia. And in 1951, when she was 30 years old, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And she went to Johns Hopkins for treatment. And before treating her cancer, her doctor just cut a little piece of her tumor and put it in a dish without telling her and sent that down the hall to George Guy, who was the head of tissue culture research at Hopkins. And no one knows exactly why, but her cells just never died. Um, George Guy and many other scientists had been trying to grow human cells and culture for decades, and it hadn't worked. Um, her cells are still alive today, growing in laboratories around the world. They became one of the most important tools in medicine, and she didn't know. And still no one knows why these cells are so hardy? It's a bit of a mystery. There, we know a few things about them. They, she had HPV, the virus that causes cervical cancer, and she had multiple copies of it. Uh, some scientists think that might have something to do with it. Her cancer itself was incredibly aggressive. Um, she had syphilis, which can weaken your immune system and make cancer grow more intensely. But so did a lot of other people, particularly in the 50s, and their cells didn't grow like this. So there was definitely something particular about her cells that no one's quite nailed down yet. Hmm. Did her normal cells, or her sort of non-carcinogenic cells, have this kind of resiliency as well? No. Uh, the scientists took both her cancer cells and her normal cells at the same time, and the normal cells died very quickly. So it was just her cancer cells that survived. Hmm. Now, how did those cells go? The, I'm talking about the cancer cells now. How did they go from being replicated in George Guy's lab to being used all over the world? Um, well, initially, George Guy just gave them all away for free to anyone who wanted to use them for research. Um, he would send them to any friends, and then they would grow them in their lab, and they'd give them to people they knew who'd given to people they knew and they spread um, that way initially and then eventually a factory was set up in, a, in the mid 50s where they began mass producing her cells to the tune of about six trillion cells a week mm. and sending those out to laboratories around the world and that was a nonprofit effort that was um, a part of the March of Dimes um, work to stop polio but then eventually a, an, a few for-profit companies were set up um, t for growing them in enormous quantities and selling them. Just an explanatory note at this point, we're showing some of the cells on our screen right now, the HeLa cells, and uh, in case people haven't tripped to this already, in the same way that Alex Rodriguez of the New York Yankees is nicknamed A-Rod, uh, Henrietta Lacks' cells are called HeLa, uh, obviously the first two letters of uh, the first and last name. Tell us about 1966 when the so-called HeLa bomb drops. What happened that year? So, yes, the... After Henrietta's cells grew, scientists began using the same techniques that they'd used to grow HeLa to grow lots of other cells, and they'd created this library of human tissues that they hoped they would be able to use to study lots of different diseases. And in 1966, this HeLa bomb was when a scientist realized that Henrietta's cells had contaminated all these other cell lines, and that without realizing it, scientists had been growing and regrowing HeLa cells, thinking they were lots of other things. And this happened because cells can float on dust particles in the air. If you touch a dish of cells and then you go touch another dish without washing your hands, you can transfer cells from one to the other. And Henrietta's cells are so much hardy, hardier than other cells that they'll essentially just outgrow any cell in a dish and take over. And you can't tell that from looking at a dish from the outside. So scientists had no idea, and this caused a really big controversy. A lot of scientists denied that it had happened at all. Um, and this was actually what led to her family learning that the cells were alive because some scientists decided to sort of treat it like a crime scene. And they figured if they could get DNA samples from her kids, they could use those to figure out what was HeLa and what wasn't and to sort of settle, kind of fix this mess that had started. I'm going to pick up on the family angle again in just a few minutes time. But first of all, I want to read a little excerpt from your book here. It goes like this. Her cells went up in the first space missions to see what would happen to human cells in zero gravity. They helped with some of the most important advances in medicine, the polio vaccine, chemotherapy, cloning, gene mapping, in vitro fertilization. There are trillions more of her cells growing in laboratories now than there ever were in her body. There's no way of knowing exactly how many of Henrietta's cells are alive today. One scientist estimates that if you could pile all HeLa cells ever grown onto a scale, they'd weigh more than 50 million metric tons, an inconceivable number given that an individual cell weighs almost nothing. 
another scientist calculated that if you could lay all HeLa cells ever grown end to end, they'd wrap around the Earth at least three times, spanning more than 350 million feet. In her prime, Henrietta herself stood only a bit over five feet tall. Now, as remarkable as all those statistics are, they are, I guess, just slightly more remarkable than your connection to this story, which for you started in high school science class. Pick up the story, if yeah. you would. Yeah, I was 16 years old, and I, my teacher mentioned these cells, which most biology teachers do, and said you know, they were one of the most important things in medicine. And for some reason, he knew her name. He wrote Henrietta Lacks in big letters on the board, and he said she was a black woman. And then that was it. And he raced to the board and class was over. And I went up to him after class and I said, well, what else do we know about her? And who was she? And did she have any kids? And what do they think about all this? And he just said, that's it. Nobody knows anything. And I just sort of became obsessed at that point. And I really never let it go. And that was in the late 80s. So it's been a while. <laughs> it has been a long journey for you. Now, the scientific community has not been covered with glory in any of this. Uh, so much of what was done uh, to her was done without her knowledge, without her family's knowledge. Um, how did all that happen? Well, you know, it was a very different time in the 50s. We didn't, the, the concept of informed consent didn't even really exist yet. And so it was absolutely standard practice to take cells uh, from people without their knowledge and use them in research. And scientists had no concept that someday they would be able to look in these cells and learn something about her kids or her grandkids or that someday they might be worth money. Um, that was all very far off in the future. For them, they were just trying to figure out the very basics of, you know, what is a cell? How does it function? What's a cancer cell? How does it behave differently than a normal cell? Um, so they were working with, they really didn't even know what they were working with at the time. Um, later, when, they, when scientists went back to her children and did research on her children, it was a slightly different story that we did have informed consent at that point. We'll but, pick up the story uh, there, though, then, because was, the, the kids you know, were not all that happy that, that uh, you know, they were having their blood samples taken for reasons they weren't entirely clear about, right? Yeah, it's true. So her, Henrietta's husband had a third grade education. He didn't know what a cell was, and he got this phone call one day. And the way he understood it was essentially, we've got your wife, she's alive in a laboratory. We've been doing research on her for the last 25 years, and now we have to test your children to see if they have the cancer that killed her. Which wasn't what the scientist said at all, but he didn't, he just didn't understand. He thought they had her in a cell, like a prison cell. That was the only kind of cell he'd ever heard of. Hmm. So his family got sucked into this world of research they didn't understand, and, and the scientists didn't realize that the family didn't understand. And so it was sort of one big communication breakdown after another, and it had some pretty drastic effects on the family. So a lot of mistrust there by the family to the scientific yeah. community. Having said that, there is a nice moment in your book where you take two of Henrietta's children to a scientist who introduced them then yeah. to their mother's cells. What was that like? Oh, it was incredible. You know, at that point, Deborah, Henrietta's daughter, was in her 50s. They both, her younger brother was too. And, and this was the first time that any scientist had ever said, okay, here's what a cell is. This is what they look like. For a long time, they did think, they realized she, Henrietta wasn't alive in the form that she had been before she died. But what it meant to have her cells alive was really unclear to them. And Deborah really worried that you know, her mother's soul was alive in these cells and that she could feel the research being done on the cells. And when you injected them with chemicals, it hurt her somehow. And so having a scientist explain all of that to them was incredibly important. And also just being able to see the cells. I mean, Deborah talked to them as if they were her mother and her mother could hear her in there and she held them. And it was a, it was a, a big moment for her. Did that help repair any of the damage and suspicion the family had felt over the years? I think it did somewhat. You know, having a scientist reach out to them and share information with them did do quite a bit for them. And it also just helped answer some of their questions. And until that point, Deborah didn't realize it was just her mother's cancer cells that were alive. She thought it was her normal cells, too. And he answered some of the basic questions for her. And, um, you know, and, and he, he, he just he cared very deeply. You know, he gave them his cell phone number and said, if you ever have any questions, you just call me and I'll answer them. And, and that meant the world to them. Hmm. Rebecca, you, you have to, I mean, our, our viewers need to know that Henrietta's color is a significant part of this story, in part because of, you know, the history that is there. The word Tuskegee is, you know, will mean a lot to some people. Uh, can you fill in the blanks on that for those who may not know? Yeah, the Tuskegee... Uh, syphilis studies are a famous, um, a famous research study done here for many, many years. It ended in the in the 50s, and it was uh, several hundred African American men who had syphilis. And scientists 
essentially studied them to watch the way that syphilis killed. So they studied the progression of the disease up until the point when the men died without offering the men treatment when it became available. Um, it was, it's been held up as one of the most unethical studies really ever done in, in the United States and, and it was all on, entirely on black men. And throughout history, African Americans in the United States have been used in research without their consent far more than any other groups. And so there's a lot of mistrust there. And the story of Henrietta Lacks has sort of become part of that, um, that history and is part of the mistrust in, of medical institutions. And let me follow up with another angle here on uh, related to ethics, in this case the financial side of it. Uh, once again from your book, Invitrogen sells HeLa products that cost anywhere from $100 to nearly $10,000 per vial. A search of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office database turns up more than 17,000 patents involving HeLa cells, and there's no way to quantify the professional gain many scientists have achieved with the help of HeLa. Do you think that this family Admittedly, Henrietta's not around today, but her, her progeny are. Are they owed anything? Well, they certainly think they are. Um, and, you know, this is one of the big questions that's raised in the book, is what do people deserve when research is done on their tissues and it is commercialized in some way or another? Um, you know, her family can't afford health insurance. They don't have access to the medical advances that were made using their mother's cells. And for them and for many people who read the book, that, um, that is a tough sort of contradiction to swallow. Um, and it's really, in a lot of ways, it's about our healthcare system and the fact that you know, when we talk about should people's cells and tissues be used in research, should people be able to have some, some of the commercial benefits that come from that, often people say, well, it's for the good of society and everyone benefits when we do research on these tissues because they then go and become these important medical advances, which is true, they do, and we want this research to happen, but it's not true that everyone has access to those advances once they happen. Um, and so it's a, it's a big, it's part of a larger issue about access to healthcare, about inequities um, in that access when it comes to different racial groups and class. Um, so it's a really complicated issue that is not easily boiled down into, you know, someone made this amount of money off of her cells and therefore this much should go to the family. Um, you know, a lot of researchers say, well, if we give money to Henrietta Lacks's family, what about the millions of other people whose tissues have been used in research without getting any of the money or without their consent? Um, and who would give them money? And I mean, it's, it's a really complicated issue, but when it comes down to it, it's also true that you know people buy and sell HeLa cells, and her family has n never benefited. And in some ways, everyone's benefited from HeLa research. Um, anyone who's ever gotten a vaccine, you know, there's so many people out there who've benefited, and her family has sort of suffered at the hands of the cells. We will pursue these issues a little more when we uh, have our discussion on the other side of the studio. But having said that, I can't help but um, be curious about all of the scientists who have had contact with the HeLa cells over the years that you have contacted, and whether any of them feel any remorse at the way all of this has transpired. Yeah, I, I get emails from scientists every day saying that they read the book, and their reaction is almost always the same, which is, you know, I had no idea. I've been working with these cells my entire career. I work with them in my lab every day. I did my dissertation on these cells. And I never stopped to think about where they came from, whether that person gave permission, whether she had a family that cared. And a lot of times I then get emails saying, well, and, and I use this other cell line, and do you know who that one came from? And, and if that person gave permission? So scientists really, they really care quite a bit about knowing the story behind the cells, but then also thinking about the issues that the Lax family story raises about trust and about the importance of communicating science to the general public. In a lot of ways, that's what the story comes down to, um, is the need to communicate what this research is when it's being done on people's tissues and you know, making it so people can understand what's going on so that they can give informed consent uh, when they're asked for it. And so scientists really feel like it's important to get over these barriers that exist right now of mistrust and miscommunications and so they the, I hear over and over again that this they feel like this knowing this story will help that um, a lot of people assume that scientists feel sort of unhappy that this, this story is out there like they've been outed somehow that they were trying to hide this history which isn't the case at all um, and when I when I was so going into the book one of the things that was very important to me was to not demonize scientists um, the book is very much about the human beings behind biological samples. It's also about the human beings behind the scientists and the importance of the research and how you know, well-meaning scientists 
are doing a lot of this work, you know, which sometimes is moving a little bit faster than the ethics that are guiding it. Rebecca, we appreciate you getting us started tonight. We're going to take a short break and then continue our discussion on the other side of the studio. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.